So today is actually our last week in the series on prayer. And first week we talked about why prayer feels so hard sometimes, and it's because it's a fight. Uh, it's a way that we battle spiritually in our world. Uh, secondly, is prayer is the way we see God's will done on earth. And third, we can see what, if we can see what the Father sees, we can say what the Father says. So every single week in this series, we've started by reciting the Lord's Prayer together. And let's not just say it, let's pray it. If you don't know it, the words are on the screen. Some of you well, if, if the words are on the screen and I'm praying, don't my eyes have to be closed? And the answer is, uh, God doesn't care if your eyes are open or closed when you're praying, okay? Let's uh, pray this together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Words are kind of interesting, at least they are to me. The same word can actually have different meanings uh, for uh, example, and sometimes it's not a different meaning, it's an expansion on a meaning. So for example, when I say the word seizure, what comes to your mind? For some people, it might be to confiscate something, like the, the law enforcement uh, seized uh, the uh, property of, of drug lords. So they, they, there was a seizure of their property, could be confiscated. It, it could also be uh, capture. Uh, let's say there was a, a, a group of government, governing officials who were meeting and there was an attack on them and there was a seizure of all of the governing officials. So we can talk about it being like capture. And then it can also be like a convulsion. The child had a seizure. And at first look, it seems like those are quite different things. The, the, the taking away of property, the taking away of people, or a child have a convulsion. But when you think about it, it's, it's almost like forces that are external seem to be taking control, or maybe a better uh, way to say it would be taking away control that someone has. And in that sense, you can actually see how seizure as a convulsion isn't so disconnected from other forms of seizure. Well, there's a word in the Bible that actually has this kind of nuance to it. And actually, there are lots of words like that. But this one I want to talk about today is called intercession. Intercession. And in the Hebrew, uh, that word is paga. And it's P-A-G-A-H. Uh, you don't have to know it. It's just interesting. It shows up about 50 times in the Old Testament. And Bible scholars say there's about eight nuances of understanding. And I, I know your, your eyes just roll up in your, your head and you just went, oh, dear God, he's going to go through all eight. And, and I'm not. I'm just going to go through uh, two this morning. Um, but it appears in, uh, over 50 times and in different ways. And it's not just different meanings. It's giving us insight. So I wanted to take two that I think will really help us to get a snapshot of what intercession can be. And I want to focus our attention on Genesis 28, and it's the story of one of the most uh, uh, modern people in Scripture. Jacob would have fared very well in our culture. And it says that Jacob left Beersheba and set out to Haran. And when he reached, reached, that's the word for intercession. Isn't it strange to be there? When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And there above it stood the Lord and he said, I am the Lord your God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south all peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. 
The first concept, the snapshot of intercession, is intercession can be an unexpected encounter. An unexpected encounter. If you want the backstory of this, Jacob had stolen his brother's blessing. He'd already swindled him out of his birthright. He's the younger of the two brothers. His brother's name is Esau. And now he had stolen his brother's blessing, which doesn't sound like a big deal to us in our culture. But in that culture, they didn't see the blessing that a father would give to a son as just nice words that he would say. They didn't see it as part of possessions. They saw it as part of your potential. And before we get too up in arms about that kind of archaic, silly system where people think that saying words somehow determines your life. People have said things to you that determined your life. Some of us remember a, a parent or a grandparent or uh, someone who spoke into our life and they saw potential and they said it out loud and as a result, we were freed to pursue something that we might not have done otherwise. Others of us have had someone speak into our lives and they told us how little we could accomplish or how little difference we would make or how little skill or competency we would have and we've allowed those words to control and limit us. So, so before we judge too harshly the feeling that someone would have about a blessing in the Old Testament, let's acknowledge how powerful words have impacted our own lives. And so Esau was really upset about this. Uh, Jacob pretended to be Esau. His father was legally blind at this point and very old, and so he dressed in the kind of clothes that Esau would dress. In fact, he made sure that he smelled like Esau would smell, and he made a meal and he brought it in, and in this case, the blessing took place after the meal and his father blessed him. And when Esau heard about it, he made a vow to himself. As soon as my father dies, and he was ill at that point, as soon as my father dies, I will kill my brother. Well, Jacob found out about this, and so he took off running. And uh, he wasn't able to prepare a trip. He wasn't able to plan for it. He just took off running for his life. And when you're going through the wilderness, it's not like driving down the road in the United States of America. There aren't lights. You, you don't have a way to illuminate your pathway. There, this is a very dangerous place to be, especially at night when you can't see. And so there comes a point at which he can't move any further without putting himself at serious risk of injury. And so he just simply lays down there. And, and to give you an idea of how little he planned and prepared for this, he didn't even have something to, to rest on for a pillow. He used a stone. How many know when you're using a stone for a pillow, that's a poorly planned trip? It's not how it's supposed to go. He falls asleep, which tells you how exhausted he is. He's laying on the ground with a stone for a pillow, and he actually goes to sleep. And while he's sleeping, he's, he has this dream. And there's this stairway, and there's angels going up and down on it. And these angels are carrying out the assignments on earth that God has given them. And then God speaks to Jacob, and he tells him what he's going to do in his life and through his, the generations that flow out of him. And when he wakes up, this is what he says, surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. Well, that's how I know people are awakened to God. They see God in places that other people don't. Maybe you're here this morning, and, and for you, you don't really see God at work anywhere, even in rooms like this. And what I would say to you is, you can move from being just a believer in God to a follower of God. This is what happens to Jacob in this moment. He believed that God existed, but now he's been awakened to God and his kingdom, and it's going to change the course of his life. Well, what's interesting is that this is not just an incidental. That's what he thought it was, an in incidental location. He just happened to be here, but it's the same word for intercession. While he didn't plan it, God did. God was intentional, and, and there's a divine appointment. And now Jacob is awakened to that. Uh, Jacob didn't think anything was going to happen in that location, but it wound up being something significant. Uh, often we find ourselves in, in uncomfortable and inconvenient situations. Uh, we didn't plan them. We didn't put them on our calendar. I never put anything on my calendar that starts with the word uncomfortable or inconvenient. But, but it happens to me. Does it happen to anybody else besides me? Yeah, just me. Okay. Well, it happens to me. 
I can be going somewhere and, uh, and a little bit pressed for time, and then for whatever reason, traffic gets slowed down. Or if you live around here, a train is bound to come, right? You just, you get the train, and, and I have this thing where I count the cars on the train, and, and the other day, over 200 cars. Now, dear Lord, it's like the never-ending train. I'm never going to get where I'm going. Uh, traffic can be stopped because of an accident. Uh, uh, sometimes we'll overhear something where we, we understand now how a person thinks or feels or, or something that they're struggling with. Uh, you can come across someone who's feeling overwhelmed by something and they kind of give language for that. And, and our natural tendency is, is just to wish I wasn't here. I don't want to be stopped for the train. I don't want to be stopped for the accident. I don't want to overhear people talking about stuff that, that they wouldn't want me to hear anyway. I don't, I don't feel comfortable knowing all the stuff that's going on. What if, what if, if that's a Paga moment? What if that is God put you in that location so that you would be able to have a response, a, di a divine appointment that God is saying, I want to make sure at least one person is in that location right now to be able to pray about what's happening. Now that would be interesting. If we're going to be about our Father's business, if we're going to be about our Father's business, then we have to be understanding that there are times when I didn't pick this place, but God has me here for a reason. That reason is not to exert or extend our will or our control. It's to invite his will and his control into that situation. Legions of angels have been released from heaven with responsibilities to make sure that God's resources are available when and where they are needed here. But we need to pray. Prayer is when you Prayer is when you pull over for the emergency vehicle and instead of just saying, oh, I can't believe now they set me behind, just actually pray, Father, whoever they're trying to help right now, would your hand be on them? Would you help them recover from whatever accident or illness they're facing? Uh, prayer when traffic is slowed down because of an accident. Maybe in all of those people, you're the only one that God has on the scene that is aware of what's happening that could extend prayer for that person. It might be the difference between life and death or quality of life. That could be the difference. Prayer is watching the news and not just reacting based on all the things that frustrate us, but seeing something different and saying something different. None of those, not one of those things would ever been on our prayer list starting the day but something happened, unintentional on our part, but intended by God to put us in the right place at the right time so someone would pray. So that, that's a really interesting concept. There's a second concept I wanna to call to your attention and it is uh, intercession can be contending for, God, for God's boundaries. Contending for God's boundaries. When the nation of Israel is about to enter into the promised land, um, they kind of mapped out the different areas that would be inhabited by people, but then they would draw lots. It's, it's like uh, reaching in a bag and, and, and pulling out, and, and every, each tribe had their name on a, a, a stick, basically. And they would reach in, and they'd pull it out. So they'd say, oh, well, this tribe is going to get that area, and then this tribe is going to get that area. And, and all of these boundaries were actually set up by God before they went into the Promised Land, because you know how people are, right? Uh, whoever was the strongest tribe or the most numerous tribe or the most gifted tribe would wind up taking most of the good stuff. That's just human nature. And so God had it divided up. And when they entered, they were to settle for nothing less than the boundaries that God had established for them. So this is going to be some very strange verses of Scripture. Uh, I, I, would, I would guarantee uh, that most of you have not been in a room where there's public teaching of God's word and these other verses that are read. But let's try it, all right? Joshua 19, verse 10. The third lot came up for Zebulon, according to its clans. The boundary of their inheritance went as far as Sarid. Going west, it ran to Merah and touched Debosheth and extended to the ravine near Joachim. How many can say amen? <laughs> you just go, what are you talking about? And when it says, and extended to the ravine, extended is the Hebrew word for intercession. 
Uh, here's another one. Uh, in Joshua 19, verse 22, the boundary touched Tabor, Jehazamah, and Beth Shemesh, and ended at the Jordan, and there were 16 towns, 16 towns in their uh, villages. That word right there that says the boundary touched, that's the word. The, the boundary touched. That's the word for intercession. Uh, Joshua 19, 26, and 27. On the west, the boundary touched, there it is again, Carmel and Shihor, uh, Lebneth, and it turned eastward toward Beth Dagon, touched Zebulon, there's the word again, touched, and the valley of Iphthael, and went north uh, to Beth Emek and Neel, passing Kubal on the left. Well, I know I've lost most of you. Why is that word there? Why is it used like that? Let me ask this question. Have you ever thought that maybe in your life God has assigned a portion and a boundary for you? That your life is not just a random set of events or the enacting of your will, your goals, your ambitions, your dreams. King David thought this. This is what he says in Psalm 16. He says, Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. He saw the boundaries that God established as an inheritance from God. It's a really cool concept. Do you believe that God has established boundaries and an inheritance for your life? Uh, the Apostle Paul believed this. Look at what he says in Ephesians 1. He said, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened. This is really fascinating because the eyes of your heart, and most of us wouldn't think that our, our heart has any eyes, but I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. God has hopes for you and he wants you to see them. Those hopes are the boundary lines of what's possible in your potential in life the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. This is what this passage is telling us, is that Jesus has not come just to get you into heaven, he's come to get heaven into you. That while we live out our lives in this world, that something of the resources and the richness of the grace and the power of God would make us contagious so that wherever we go, people wind up being more hopeful, more peaceful, more joyful. Uh, all of those things, just because we're... we're we're, we're contagious with that reality. This is what God intends for us. And he's established boundaries. And here's what I want you to know. Those boundaries were not intended to limit your life. Those boundaries were intended for you to contend for in life because our natural tendency is to settle for far less than what God would hope for us. The inheritance that he has marked out for us. We rarely reach the limit that God intends. We tend to settle for less. And there is a kind of prayer that can reject the limits being imposed on others or on ourselves and press into what God intends. That's the kind of prayer. And it's unplanned. It, it's not something that you would have thought of. It's not usually on your list of things to cover in prayer today. You know, you might be praying regarding some job situations, praying regarding a family situation, praying regarding a friend that you know is going through a hard time. And these are regularly recalled before God just because you want to keep that line of communication open and keep inviting God to participate in, in their lives. But there are some things that just show up unintentionally. And every once in a while, you will come across something where you just... It feels, it feels wrong. In fact, you're likely to have an emotion, especially if it has to do with your family. It's, that, that's not right. Why would they settle for so little? Why would they just take that and think that that's all that there is for them in life? And that thought right there could be an indication that God is saying to you, it's time to pray that a person will not settle for less than the boundaries that they're supposed to pursue in life. God intends to enlarge the current boundaries and the limits of your life. He has boundaries for you that you have not yet experienced. A family member may be stuck in a struggle. A coworker may be limited uh, 
by small minds or unavailable networks. A, 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 a business could be limited by lack of, of capacity and, and lack of, of access to technology. Every single one of those can be opportunities for us to pray that whatever God's boundaries are for that person or that business or that situation, that we would contend for those and we would see what God intends rather than what people are settling for. God intended boundaries are recovered through intercession. That's how it works. It's not just, I'm going to power up. I'm going to talk more positively. I'm going to study on YouTube the ways that I can use my, my body language to get me a better shot in the door. You, you can do all of those things. But I can tell you that there are things that will set you back in life and they will set the people that you love back in life. And if we are unaware of what God intends for their life, we will not pray in those moments. And that can be the difference. There's something God intends, and maybe it's being lost through disobedience. Maybe it's being lost through, through ignorance. Maybe it's being lost through some kind of sickness, some kind of heartache and grief. Something is eroding and encroaching on what God intends, and God has put you in that place to be able to say, I am going to contend for what God wants in this. I don't want them to settle for something less than that. How many would hope someone would pray that for you? This is what God calls us to. This is what God calls us to. We can have a sense with something is less and we can intercede in a conversation with God. I don't think that what I'm seeing represents your intended limits in this person's life. Help them reach the boundaries you have for them. So there's two things that you can talk about to God that are unplanned. Look for unplanned events in your day that could be a divine appointment and things that seem less than they could be or less than they should be. And have a conversation with God. I'm going to have the worship team come out. Um, the challenge, I think, is we get caught up into kind of a, a reaction in life. And so one of the more common emotions anyone feels these days is the emotion of frustration. And the second most common emotion that people feel these days is fear. And quite honestly, most of our frustration is actually driven by an underlying fear. And in our world, we've become, well, we've been programmed by conversations around us and by media and social media's input into our lives as to how we are to respond. And lots of people do. Uh, they post their thoughts or their feelings or their objections. Or, and, uh, you know, this isn't a message that you should never post anything online. That's not the point. The point is that doesn't change anything. Not one thing. Nothing. Our world has, has been snake bit and the, the venom has run through our system. This suggests that if I weigh in by saying something out loud or typing something in all caps, that that's all I'm capable of doing. That's my limit. And you will wake to another day tomorrow where the world is exactly the same or slightly worse than after your response. This is what our world believes. That's the best I can do. Vent, rant, type all caps. And then, well, at least people know where I stand. I'm not asking you to tell people where you stand. I'm asking you to take a stand in prayer and to have a conversation with someone that can actually make a difference in the world in which we live. That's a really good place for an amen. That's a really good place for an amen. That we are not victims of what is going on in our world. We're invaders into a broken and a dark place, and we bring in the will of God with our prayers. And so it might not be on your agenda, but you just saw something. You just heard something. 
something that represents less than what God intends or something that represents danger to someone else. And in that moment, you can lift your voice towards heaven. And it's amazing what a difference that will make. Heavenly Father, would you please help us today? Help us not settle for what the world allows us to do. This is what our world says. Our world says you're allowed to rant, you're allowed to vent, you're allowed to post. But our world does not suggest that we pray. Would you help us do more than the world tells us we can do? Would you help us have a conversation with you? It may not have been planned on our part, but it may well have been planned on your part. And you're waiting for an invitation to bring all the resources of heaven into that situation. I ask that you would help us with that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together.